I'm really happy um, that our first speaker is who he is because uh, he's actually a man who um, I would consider really lives what we're talking about today uh, in terms of um, Mark Daniels started off being someone who, as he describes, um, was, you know, trying to get into social enterprise and then he, he talked about um, buying and then selling and now is in a situation where he enables social enterprises. Uh, he comes from an organisation called Social Traders whose purpose is to support and encourage the development of, co of commercially viable social enterprises in Australia. And I think this whole thing around commercially viable, we can do this work but can we do it in a commercially viable way so it's sustainable and we can keep going and we can actually grow? Mark joined Social Traders in 2008 as a manager in policy and development. His wide ranging experience in service delivery, advocacy and policy development. Prior to Social Traders, Mark worked with the Brotherhood of St Lawrence, managing a number of social enterprises aimed at assisting people into mainstream employment as well as providing expertise to other agencies looking to establish social enterprise. His extensive experience developing policy and community development activities for public housing estates in inner city Melbourne, and Mark is a director on the board of Yarra Community Housing. He also has two children, an 11-year-old boy and a nine-year-old girl. So please welcome our first speaker, Mark Daniels. Thanks, Anne. Wow. Thanks, Anne. Um, it is such a pleasure to be here. I don't think I've ever quite spoken in a venue like this. Um, thanks to the organisers and to the sponsors. Um, my job really is to uh, set a bit of a scene, uh, set a scene for social enterprise in Australia. Uh, so I'm going to spend the next 20 minutes walking you through some definitions and understandings of what social enterprise is. Um, Firstly, my organisation, Arne's really just spoken about it. We're an organisation that's very focused on uh, developing commercially viable social enterprises in Australia. But at the, at the core of what we think and, and feel is uh, a view that the market can deliver sustainable social outcomes. And our vehicle for achieving that is social enterprise. So we invest all our energy into um, supporting social enterprises to, uh, to develop. So, we kind of work in five areas, but three in particular. We do all of these sorts of things. Uh, but most of our energy goes into helping people to start social enterprises. So we run programs. One's called The Crunch. Uh, it's a capability program. And we get people, uh, we skill them up uh, to, uh, with a business plan that makes them investment ready, fundamentally. So we take them from concept to startup. The second area where we put a lot of attention is um, helping people to understand social enterprise and raising awareness of social enterprise in Australia. And the third area where we do a lot of work is in opening markets for social enterprise. So we're, uh, we just had a business breakfast on social procurement. Um, we do a lot of work in social procurement and helping buyers to understand how they can engage with social enterprise and sometimes change their purchasing uh, policies and practices in order to buy from social enterprise. All right, what is social enterprise? Um, uh, if I asked everyone in this room what a social enterprise is, I know that apart from five or six people, I would get uh, as many different answers as there are people in the room. Um, for the purposes of today and for the purposes of social traders, I want to walk you through the definition that we use and why we use that definition. Just to start with, um, I want to make a distinction between social innovation and social enterprise. The two get blurred quite often. Many social enterprises aren't particularly innovative, but many social enterprises are innovative, and social innovation is not just about social enterprise. I just want to put that on the table. It does get confused, same as social entrepreneurship. It's not all about social enterprise. But to go into a definition, when we started operating in 2008 as um, social traders, um, we had an advocacy and lobbying function as well as you know, helping to support the development of social enterprise. The hardest thing was that we didn't really understand the social enterprise sector in Australia. In fact, no one really understood the social enterprise sector in Australia. The hard thing about social enterprise is that there's, there's no company form called social enterprise. And uh, the ATO doesn't capture it and, and nor does um, the Australian Bureau of Statistics. They can't because there's no um, um, element that's unique to social enterprise. So um, 
it was really important to get a definition for social enterprise. So we worked with a Queensland University of Technology um, and uh, undertook a project called Phases, Finding Australia's Social Enterprise Sector. And that project set out to do a whole range of things. Particularly, it set out to identify and map the Australian social enterprise sector. So it wanted to know how many, where, what they do, how long they've been around, what, they mo what they're motivated by, what social impacts they deliver. But in order to map something, you had to define it in the first place. So we ran workshops and we looked at international definitions of social enterprise. And we came up with something that's internationally consistent but has some unique elements, uh, but, but is very comparable internationally. And so there are four key elements that uh, an organisation has to have, in, in our view, in order to be a social enterprise. And a lot of this has now been adopted by governments across Australia and the OECD has also adopted this definition. Social enterprises are organisations that are led by an economic, social, environmental or cultural mission consistent with public or community benefit. The most important words in that are public or community benefit. They're driven by public or community benefit. They're not driven by private uh, shareholder wealth or the creation of individual wealth. Uh, the second element is that they trade to fulfill their mission. So they have to sell goods and services, which makes them quite distinct from a, a number of not-for-profit organisations that don't sell goods and services, that, that deliver government-funded programs. They derive a substantial proportion of their income from trade. So 100% of their income doesn't have to come from trade. Of course, it's, it's really nice when 100% of their income does come from trade because they're not dependent on other income sources. They actually, uh, the market is the only um, thing that they actually have to respond to. And finally, they reinvest the majority of their profit or surplus in the fulfillment of their mission. And I guess this is really important because it means they don't have to be not-for-profit organisations. So for-profit companies, companies limited by shares, in fact, the whole company range, apart from publicly listed companies, could be a social enterprise by definition. And there are a number of examples of, of, of uh, for-profit structures being used and, and writing into the constitution of that for-profit structure a commitment to reinvest the majority of the profits from the business back into a social community benefit. Okay, why social enterprise? Really quickly, this is just an image to capture the fact that social enterprises are different from community programs. Community programs tend to burn bright and short and deliver high social impact. And social enterprises will often not deliver the high social impact and it's something that funders and investors need to get their head around. They do it over a long period of time. They don't burn bright and short. If they're well run, as businesses need to be, they burn for a long, long time and they deliver a, long, a lot of social impact over an extended period. Sorry. Okay. We think that social enterprises fit into three fundamental motivations. One is around employment and training, employment training support for marginalised groups. The second is products and services in direct response to a community need that is unmet by, unmet by the marketplace. And the third one is um, profit redistribution for social impact. The only one I would really want to touch on, I'll give you some examples in a tick, is around products and services in direct response to an unmet community need. Basically, it's saying where there's a market failure, social enterprises can often solve or come up with a solution to that problem. And the examples I've got there are around community childcare centres, even the Bendigo Community Bank model, not the Bendigo Bank model, but the community banking model, Hepburn Wind, like, uh, why does community childcare exist? Because the market wasn't meeting the needs. And so the, the uh, uh, social enterprise sector filled the gap. Just to give three examples of each of those, we call them buckets. Um, bucket one, two, and three. You can call them that. You can ignore our bucket analogy, but uh, we, we, we find it very simple. We ran social enterprise awards with Foresters Community Finance this year. Um, we got three, we had four winning social enterprises in those awards. Uh, three of them, uh, all four of them fit into three buckets, but I want to use three of them as examples of these uh, different motivations. One is resource recovery, which is based in um, Foster Tunkurry. They are a social enterprise that um, runs a tip shop and they uh, run a transfer station. Uh, they've been doing that for 23 years in Foster Tunkurry. And their social motivation is to create employment for Indigenous ex-offenders. Uh, there is a significant uh, Indigenous unemployment issue in the Foster Tunkari area. I think it runs to about 95%. Uh, 
So these guys, over 23 years, have been employing Indigenous ex-offenders as their social beneficiary group. And in that time, they've only had one ex-offender go back to jail, and they held the job for that person. And when he comes out of jail, they'll be back into that job. They're the largest employer of Aboriginal people in the Foster Tungkari area. And they run a 10% profit annually. The second bucket, uh, and this is the winner of Social Enterprise of the Year Small, uh, the last one was Social Enterprise Large, is Connecting Up. And a lot of you, if you're a not-for-profit, have probably come into contact with Connecting Up. They sell um, computer software uh, at discounted rates to not-for-profit organisations. Over the last 20-odd uh, years, they've saved uh, the not-for-profit sector $50 million in spending on um, software by uh, their sales process. And the third one is Thank You Water. And if you haven't heard of Thank You Water, you will soon, because they're just about to go into Safeway and Coles. They're in 7-Eleven. They're in all the Australia Post stores. They're in IGA. And Thank You Water um, uh, sells a water product, um, bottled water, and they've just started to sell food and other products as well, where all of the profits from the sales of the water go to uh, water aid projects in developing countries. Uh, the two people who run this, a couple, uh, were 19 when they started this social enterprise. I think they're almost 25. Dan Flynn, the founder, got uh, Young Victorian of the Year last this year, actually. It was just announced. And I think they redistributed $500,000 to water aid projects this year. Next year, when they're in Coles and Woolworths, they're probably going to treble or quadruple that amount. So just those are the three fundamental motivations and three examples of those. What are the characteristics of a, a, a successful social enterprise? Well, firstly, it's a good business. And I really want to uh, sort of ram that home. They are businesses fundamentally. They are not community programs. And the use of the term program and social enterprise interchangeably is quite confusing at times. They're not programs. Um, they uh, live and die based on the market. All the rules of small business apply to them. Um, and they start based on market opportunities. If there isn't a market opportunity, the assumption that you can build it and they will come will usually result in the failure of that social enterprise. Not anyone can start a social enterprise. You have to have the right skills or you need to be able to build the skills in your organisation and you need the right people around you to make it successful. In some cases, being a social enterprise actually reduces your financial sustainability. So if I'm employing people who are disadvantaged, I have a productivity deficit in my business. Someone's got to cover the cost of that productivity deficit and it's very rarely the buyer who will pay for that. So you have to accept a reduced profit margin in a business like that and in some cases philanthropy or government or others have to fill the gap in that business so that it's that's able to be sustainable. In some cases it can actually enhance the financial sustainability. And there are many examples, uh, and one of my favourites is, is the Yakandanda Community Development Company in, in remote Victoria, if such a word exists, but it's six hours from Melbourne. You know, the local petrol station went bust. The community bought the petrol station, the right to have the petrol station in that community. And then they ran a community share float in 2002. And as a social enterprise, it's been incredibly successful. As a private business, it lost $500 a week. As a social enterprise, it uh, is now, um, uh, as the Yakandanda Community Development Company, it's bought the local community newspaper and the local um, uh, hardware as, as well. So it's actually scaling up and quite successful. Instead of doing 10,000 litres of petrol uh, a week, it does 35 thousand litres of petrol a week because people in that community own it. So where is social enterprise at in Australia? I'm just going to tilt this up if I can. A um, couple of points, and these are just some key stats that I uh, assembled for this presentation. There's an estimated 20,000 social enterprises in Australia. That came out of the research we did with QUT. Um, the number has grown at a rate of 37% over the past five years. That's um, been undertaken by independent research as well. 73% of the uh, 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 social enterprises in the phases research have been operational for at least five years, 62% at least 10 years. It's quite a mature sector. The word is new, the phrase is new, but social enterprises have been operating for hundreds of years. And uh, as Joe Barraquette would say, uh, an academic in this area, social enterprise has been around since Babylonian times. Uh, 
Australian social enterprises operate in all markets, from the local to the international and all sectors. So at the highest level of the Australian Bureau of Statistics categories of industries, there are 25 industries. Out of the sim sample of 350 social enterprises, they were operating in every industry. So there aren't barriers to social enterprise in, in relation to industry. 39% of all income in the not-for-profit sector is earned through trading, equating to around $22 billion per annum. And we estimate that social enterprise is around 2 to 3% of GDP in Australia. And I'll just click through some of these. These are the stats coming out of phases. And what's interesting about them is that um, the breakdown of small, medium and large social enterprises, you can see in that pie chart, almost mirrors the breakdown of small, medium and large private businesses in Australia as well. So there aren't barriers to growth for social enterprise necessarily inherent in the fact that they are social enterprise. Here are some reflections on social enterprise. I think it's on a wave that started really about 15 years ago. Um, I think that previous waves were led by really economic necessity. So, uh, uh, you know, we founded mutuals and uh, cooperatives uh, 100 odd years ago because uh, no, no other model was appropriate to set up those organisations. In Victoria, we have something called the RACV that's 120 or 130 years old. It's a great example of the social enterprise that was created because that was the best way to create that business structure. A lot of the insurance companies were mutualised initially. Social enterprise was a form of, uh, uh, wasn't, it wasn't called social enterprise clearly, but it was using the principles of social enterprise. What we've seen in the 1990s is really a link between job creation and social enterprise. That's been the new entry into this space. So it's kind of a dynamic space, it's, it's evolving over time, but probably the latest iteration is now incorporating job creation as well. Um, what we're probably seeing is, is these groups now. We're seeing the community sector and we're seeing the no bull <laughs> to use my French, no bullshit realists from regional and rural Australia, people who just want to find the right solution to the problem and a community buyout and so forth is often a social enterprise model. We're also, also seeing Gen Y really hooking into this space um, and we're seeing a lot of people exiting the corporate sector as well. They're quite intrigued by social enterprise and I'm stunned by uh, when we advertise for a job the number of respondents that we get. We get hundreds of people applying for a job coming out of the corporate sector because they want to use the corporate skills to generate social benefit. Um, past waves have ended quite abruptly and I guess what I mean by that is that you know, when the money runs out or the impetus runs out, they tend to stop. This wave's been quite long. It's been running for about 15 years now and I keep wondering when we're going to get over the wave or past the wave and I don't even feel like we're halfway up the wave at this stage. The interest in social enterprise continues to grow and uh, we're not seeing any uh, abatement in that at this stage. I just want to finish on social traders really quickly. Um, uh, and, and what we can do, what we do do, and what we can do for you, but some of the things we do, we, we are Victorian based, a lot of our work's in Victoria, um, and we're not specifically working interstate at this stage, but we are bringing uh, people from other states um, and, and involving them in some of the programs that we're running in Victoria. So, um, ooh, okay, let me just get all this up. Okay, these are five things that I really wanted to mention. If you're interested in social enterprise, we have, uh, and, and uh, you just want to do some initial exploration, we created something called the Social Enterprise Builder, which is an online tool on our website, which is just Google Social Traders, um, and uh, it basically takes you through from uh, very little knowledge of social enterprise right through to a complete business plan. So we've had uh, probably about uh, 1,500 people work through the whole process and complete business plans or partially complete business plans over the last two years using the builder. It's a really useful tool. Um, we've got the Social Enterprise Finder. That's a directory of social enterprises across Australia. So what we did with the phases data that we collected on finding social enterprise is we got 5,000 social enterprises that we found online. We put them all into a database and it's called the Social Enterprise Finder. So you can actually see what exists in the Northern Rivers area uh, already that you may not have known were social enterprises. Uh, 
this year we ran the Social Enterprise Awards with Foresters. We're also running Social Enterprise Awards in 2014. And really that captures excellence in social enterprise. So if you run a social enterprise or if you're interested in some of the case studies that I mentioned before, please go and have a look at that. In terms of capability building, and I know that, that that's where a lot of people are at, um, we run a program called The Crunch. Um, we just took it out of Victoria um, and we have placements from Queensland, New South Wales, uh, NT, South Australia and um, Tasmania. Um, we opened it up to those areas. I'm not exactly sure where we've gotten representation from this year because we're just finalising that. But we've got six places from outside of Victoria and we're going to scale that in the future as well. So that is something that you can engage with. That's an intense um, uh, mentoring and support process over a six month period to take people who have a really good idea for a social enterprise and wrap all the skills and support and expertise around them that will assist them to de develop a fantastic business plan. And then we assist them by directly investing in them ourselves and uh, bringing other investors to the table to invest in those social enterprises. So the crunch is definitely an opportunity that's available to um, Byron and the Northern Rivers moving forward. Um, and I guess um, a big plug for this one, and I'll put a flyer out, is the Good Gift Shop. Um, my plug is because uh, we, only, uh, we only set the Good Gift Shop up uh, and launched it a week and a half ago um, because Christmas is coming. And the Good Gift Shop is a place where you can buy social enterprise Christmas gifts. We've got over 100 gifts that you can buy. Um, it's all online. It's one shop. And uh, you can know that you're buying from a social enterprise because we've vetted the organisations that are selling there as well. And that's it from me. And unbelievably, I did it in 19.57 seconds. And I was supposed to do it in 20. So, yeah. Uh, hi, Jimmy Willumden, One Health Organisation. Um, I'm interested to hear um, your thoughts about the hybridisation between social enterprise and the not-for-profit not sector. Yeah. And the way in which they yeah. overlap, intermingle, have grey areas, etc. Yeah, okay. Um, I think one of the stats that I put up was how much of the income in the not-for-profit sector is earned. Um, it's a lot. It's 39%. I think... Um, there's only about 25% that comes from government into the not-for-profit sector when you include everything, including sporting clubs and so forth. So um, the not-for-profit sector is incredibly entrepreneurial in Australia. Um, in international research, we've got the third most entrepreneurial not-for-profit sector in the world. So um, we're not coming off a low base. We've got quite a high base. Um, and that's got a lot to do with the fact that, you know, it was really only in the 60s that we started to, uh, government really started to pay for community services in a significant way as well. So, you know, there's a long history. The organisation I worked for um, five years ago, the Brotherhood of St Lawrence, 50% of its income comes through trade. But before 1960, um, uh, probably about 70% came through trade and about 20% came through bequests and grants to that organisation. So. You know, we're, not, we're coming off a pretty good base in terms of entrepreneurial tendencies in the not-for-profit sector. I think that um, social enterprise straddles uh, is quite comfortable in a not-for-profit landscape. I would pose some interesting thoughts. Um, I think that quite often social enterprises thrive when they're not within uh, and they don't have a parent not-for-profit organisation. I, I actually think um, uh, having a board uh, that is very focused on business and social enterprise as opposed to welfare and government and others is quite a strategic, uh, strategically valuable decision to make for a social enterprise. Um, I think that um, it probably makes leaner and more effective decisions when you've got that sort of structure in place. Um, and I guess I'm not saying that large not-for-profits can't do this, but I think one of the challenges large not-for-profits end up trying to do everything and they've got uh, 15 different domains that they operate in, from childcare right through to aged care. And being an expert in social enterprise really requires you to be very focused on running a business successfully. And I think um, CEOs who try and be across everything will struggle to run a really successful social enterprise while they're doing that. It's my personal thoughts in this instance. I also think hybridisation really is saying, Perhaps what's the role of for-profit social enterprises because, you know, you're looking at the not-for-profit social enterprise challenges. I think for-profit for is not a bad structure for social enterprise. Our advice to anyone would be do the work, develop the business plan, and the company structure will fall out of that. You shouldn't go in presuming that uh, not-for-profit 
is the right structure to achieve the social outcome that you're seeking. And quite often, access to capital and how you capitalise your business will drive the company structure that you adopt at the end of the day. Uh, lady over here. Hi, my name is Megan. Um, how do you make the really ugly social issues attractive mm. Mm. in terms of social enterprise? And I know ugly is not the best word, but I'm thinking about things like perpetrator programs and do you know what I mean? Like stuff that's really tricky. <laughs> um, I, think it's, um, I think it's a difficult question to answer. Uh, you know, where, where is the money in social enterprise at the moment? Well, it's interesting. Uh, we just got um, investment from the State Government of Victoria from youth, from women's and from environment. I would say youth and environment are very sexy issues uh, as well as indigenous um, and I don't want to degrade those issues at all. They're incredibly important issues. But how do you get some of the other issues raised up? Uh, I, I don't think there's a simple answer and I think when you're running a social enterprise, uh, I don't know if I'd be talking always about the beneficiary group. Um, sometimes talking about the beneficiary group can actually be counter to the goal that you're trying to see, uh, you're seeking to achieve, sorry. So to, to give an example, we had a guy out from the UK who ran um, a social enterprise about three years ago, uh, John Montague his name was, and, and John said to us, he had kids, ex-offenders, working in a, 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 a conference centre basically. Um, and, and there was a restaurant, and he said, um, we, never, we don't advertise that we have ex-offenders in this social enterprise, but when they get the bill, that's when we tell them that we have ex-offenders in the business. And then they go, geez, the food was nice, and it came from ex-offenders, instead of going in thinking, Jesus, I don't know what I'm going to be eating, it, you know, like all of the natural concerns are raised in some people. So I think you... You know, I think sprouting it out loud can actually sometimes be damaging to what you're trying to achieve. And conversely, sometimes it's incredibly uh, critical to what you're trying to achieve as well. It draws a whole lot of attention and media and interest in what you're doing because it has a social goal. I, I think you've just got to weigh it up. Yep. One more brief question. Uh, gentleman in the middle here. The dark shirt, yeah. Uh, hi, uh, my name's Andrew Hegedus from Grafton. Um, I'm interested in uh, where you, how you're feeling uh, in terms of the, the normal banking sector and the finance sector coming on board uh, and looking at, I guess, finance products that suit this type of sector. Uh, I know that we've got, a, over the last few years, we've had a, a growth of a lot of the, um, yeah, like Foresters and, and, and Social Ventures Australia and yeah. CFA and all that sort of stuff. Yep. Um, essentially, uh, I, I work predominantly in the Aboriginal community. Uh, we've been developed, we've been working through our, our whole model has been based on communal ownership and uh, and working with the not-for-profit sector. Mm -hmm. I guess the challenge that's been in our our sphere and, and a lot of the not-for-profits for a lot of years is 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 accessing the, the right financial products. Yep. Um, it's only been until now, and what had drawn me today was to come and actually finally have a listen to some of the, the banking areas and, and how they're approaching it. Yeah, good. Um, about 20 years ago, a colleague of mine sitting here, we, we had a conversation with uh, Rishorgi, Andrew Rishorgi, when he was Deputy Premier, uh, pleading with him to, to approach the finance sector to, to try and look at how that the government can play a role in trying to stimulate the finance sector in developing products that yep. suited the, the not-for-profit sector. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the, the returns over a longer term. Um, I think that social enter enterprise and not-for-profits have a a real place in depressed economies like the region because our, 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 our objectives in terms of return on capital is a lot different yep. than, than just a, a, pro, a private one and I think that, uh, yes, yeah, so I'd be interested in what you're feeling is how the, the, the general banking sector is starting to look at it as a, a viable mm -hmm. product area. Thanks. Uh, look, uh, you know, I'm certainly no expert on this and there are others who will be speaking today who are. <laughs> um, I would say that um, I think, um, and including one of our sponsors, I guess. Uh, NAB's going to be talking as well. Um, I don't think there are a lot of um, banks who are developing tailored products for social enterprise. That would be the first comment, and that's why CETIFs have been created as a response to, to a gap. And CETIFs are social enterprise development investment funds, and you'll hear about that a bit later. Um, but I am very aware that the, all of the banks are developing social products as well, and I'm not going to comment on the social products what I would say is that my organisation um, has taken a very deliberate position on investment. 
We have DGR status, so we're restricted in how we can invest in organisations. So we don't take equity positions. It's sort of not on the agenda for us. Um, we invest debt and, and grant. So we blend. We do blended finance. And, um, and the, the mixture of debt and grant depends on the business plan. So if the business is going to be very profitable and it can demonstrate that, then uh, the uh, mix will be heavy debt and very little, if any, grant. And if it's going to deliver a high social impact but won't be very profitable as a business, then it will be high grant and small amount of debt. We really like the idea of having debt in every deal that we do with um, social enterprises because we think free money is not actually the answer. Uh, we think it's really important to build in um, uh, a culture of having to repay something as part of what you're doing and building that into your, um, your business every year and, and your financial planning. Um, but we, al we also think it builds a credit record for organisations. Um, and we've had, uh, we have actually, we've had no defaulters yet. We're into our fourth year um, of that blended finance model. And I guess what I would say is there's probably models of finance that don't yet exist and that need to exist and we're running ours as a demonstration of how that might work. And I think, you know, Foresters and, and, and others are running other models that are demonstrating things. And I think, you know, it's an immature space at this stage. I think in a couple of years we'll be in a position, I know, where, where we'll actually have a body of evidence that can say what works best for which sorts of social enterprise models as well. So, you know, it's not an authoritative or conclusive response, but... Um, it's a, I think it's an embryonic space. I mean, capital fundraising through, you know, you're going to hear about co-ops in a minute. I mean, using community share raising is another option, and now we're getting into the, the whole um, crowdsourcing model. You know, there is a really interesting space emerging around financing social enterprise and related sort of entities. Yeah, yeah thank you. It's a watch this space. I think so. Mark Daniels, thank you thank very you. much.